Um, explosion of IoT devices and increased complexity of the ecosystems will create many challenges for the next generation of developers. And um, we're here today to tell you a little bit of, uh, about those challenges and how you can get ready to overcome them in the future. So as developers, we're all going to have to deal with some sort of IoT devices in the next five years or so. And um, the ecosystem is not as well defined as typical object-oriented um, ecosystem, APIs, frameworks, or, or um, design patterns that we all use to every single day. And with reduced cost and increased processing power of IoT devices, we're seeing growth in numbers of connected products. And just think about your own homes. Uh, and we all know a little bit too well that as soon as the whole family starts to buy those products, we're all going to act as an IT support and technical support for them. And we are in the front of this battle. Uh, we have millions of customers and dozens of partners using a variety of connected devices in everyday life. So let me tell you just a little bit about Asurian. We at Asurian help people to protect, connect, and enjoy the latest tech to make their life easier. I mean, think about the scale. We have 19,500 experts that help 300 million customers worldwide to tackle their most common and uncommon technical issues every day. And we just call, tap, chat, phone call away from everything from same day delivery of your replacement device, help setting up a wireless camera, or troubleshooting your streaming issues. And now we are uh, specifically focusing on the connected home market. So as an industry, in general, we have a great opportunity ahead of us. We are seeing proliferation of connected devices and services. We change the way how we actually consume content, uh, anything from movies, TV shows, live TV, and of course, the music. And we all already own and use connected devices, and we use over-the-top services. And other industries are also getting heavily involved. We're seeing uh, new buildings being built with IoT devices and connected devices already included. So we're sure this is the future. This is the future for all of us, but what does it really mean to all of us? So every time the industry adds one more protocol, one more device, one more feature or behavior, one more service, the whole complexity of the ecosystem is exponentially growing. Just think about all the issues that could be related to such an environment in our line of work. So we believe that data and analytics are key and critical components to solve, to, to create any connected home platform and solve those issues. And our audience is actually much broader than just end users because everyone will need this kind of analytics to support their businesses. Mobile phone and IoT manufacturers would like to understand what's happening in the user's home to be able to produce better products and simplify the setups. ISPs would like to understand how the bandwidth is being consumed, where is traffic being generated, whether uh, how you stream your content, whether you're using um, you know, building TV or, or um, uh, one of the streaming devices, are you using the OME router or have, do you have your own? And users, of course, would like to know what to buy. There is currently seven different protocols that are being widely used by the connected home devices. And there are hubs that's supposed to facilitate those different protocols um, by uh, you know, talking to those different languages. But even those hubs have problems, and they not always support the devices that they were supposed to support. And of course, hubs don't talk to each other either. So you know, the question of whether, uh, what should I buy? Will it fit in my current ecosystem? Will it work at my home? Will I be able to maintain? Uh, the functionality of my home, and will I achieve the actual functionality that I want? Right. Um, so what kind of analytics? Well, here are some examples. So uh, our platform produces the descriptive analytics that can answer questions like, what happened? Or diagnostics that answer questions, why did something happen? And prescriptive analytics answer questions like, what should be done? to this particular user in this particular time? What can we do to make the service better? And predictive analytics answer questions like, when will something happen? Or when will something happen again? And sales analytics answer questions like, who wants this? Help you predict 
your sales trends and understanding the market segmentation and how to improve the sales. So by understanding data and signals generated by connected devices, we can power those analytics and provide solution to some of those challenges. So just imagine that you're a data scientist and you work on uh, a project to find out why Netflix buffers on certain type of TVs more than on the other types of TVs. And just think about, think about the complexities that go into, into that problem. Maybe it's a software on the TV, or maybe it is the hardware, or maybe it's the Wi-Fi itself, or maybe it's the signal strength, or maybe someone reconfigured the DNS the night before, or maybe it's the ISP, or Netflix, or your neighbor's Wi-Fi, or maybe it's that new camera that you just installed yesterday, or maybe it just happens when everybody else is also streaming, or maybe your house got compromised. Some same level of complexity goes to thinking about device compatibility and the device security. So there are many problems to solve in this industry, we believe, and um, we've been in this business for a few years, and we have learned that opportunities come and go very, very, very quickly. So time to market is extremely critical when solving those issues, because you don't want to be sitting on a team that develops product that never ships, that never see days of, days of uh, light of the day, sorry, and um, and uh, likewise, your company might be sitting on a petabytes of data. That's another challenge that's never been actually used to its full potential. Nobody really understands what's in the data. And that data is growing exponentially. It's more and more of that data coming every day. So we believe that um, the decisions should be made and applied on the data as data is traveling through your system for the first time. While you're ingesting the data, you should be making decisions using machine learning and other techniques to evaluate the data and not worry too much about um, uh, reprocessing the data for analytics. So with that, Shobit will take you through the journey of what we have uh, found out so far and challenges we found and how we solve those problems. Thank you, Thomas. Good afternoon, everyone. This is the part of presentation where we share each other's pain, the engineering story. Uh, we're going to cover a few important parts in here. We're going to cover the challenges that we faced while doing the aggregation for the IoT devices. We're going to figure out how did we overcome through the Spark streaming and Delta leveraging that. We're going to also cover a quick demonstration of how did we actually overcome them. And in the end, what were the learnings throughout the journey? But why should we the guys, or why should we the challenges that you guys might face? So we at Assurance keep pushing ourselves to use the latest and edging technologies. The moment Spark releases something, we already try to put it in production within a week or so. I know it is risky, but we do this quite a few times. And which means that we face the challenges, which as a IoT device aggregator, for the devices which you really do not own, which the data you do not understand, you will face. Also, technically, that we get end up facing. So, these are the kind of storms, that's why we are more worried about than the regular ones that keep hitting humanity. So, imagine just one fine day you are sitting at your home, or probably in a fine day sitting in office, hopefully like this one, which is going fine, we believe. And then now you're manager or whomsoever, VP calls you, CEO calls you and say, hey, we want to design something where somebody sitting in their house, the application install whatever you guys have developed, and then you can give some actionable items to the user for whatever going on wrong in their house. And you say, great, I can design it. You go back and start thinking of it. What will happen? For next six months, we can tell you, we have gone through this journey, those six months are gonna suck. And why are they going to suck? Few of things are here. As an engineer, with the infinite capacity and capabilities, code, code, infinite, please, infinite storage in there, the product, the user, the consumer, and the engineers believe that everything can be done instantaneously, which means no matter what kind of data are you getting, you should have it processed within a few seconds. For the users, the expectations are increasing day by day to be a real-time experience, which means the faster you experience have, the better. 
For example, what Thomas has said, we just gonna build up a bit over it. So I'm sitting in my house. There are few security cameras, of course, few mobile devices. I have chosen the best Amazon Echo or Google Home, whatever you believe is better for yourself. So you have like six, seven different kind of devices. Of course, each of them best in their category. So developed by a different altogether kind of the provider, which do not talk to each other, which do not understand or follow each other's data. And you are responsible for figuring out what's going on wrong in the house. So you're a third party aggregator who do not understand any of the data that is being generated. What is the kind of data structure that you're gonna get? We named it chaos. That's only what you get. That's why your first six months are gonna suck. Moving forward, data use cases, we all understand that there is not always just one use case you wanna follow. There are multiple use cases with the same data you want to fulfill. For example, your CEO wants to see a real-time report, real-time dashboard of how that option is going on and how many homes are going down, how many homes are up, houses are up, but your product wants to actually see this monthly, that how much value is it really adding? So there is a challenge. The same data that you're processing, you want to fulfill several use cases. Of course, data science and other use cases remain there, but we are not gonna get deeper. I think we understand all of them. So we also had the challenge, but the processing had to be done. Aggregations are the reality of data science. Without aggregations, we would be nothing. And that is a reality for us as well. And if it was to get any simpler, we were to classify houses before we can aggregate them for our users to have a simple, simplified, aggregated view, if I was to say in my product's language, so that it can be actionable by the devices or the categories that you are classifying in. And of course, these were the business use cases, so they should be driven by the machine learning models that have to be applied in the real-time environment. So in the hand, you have to, you're receiving a continuous stream of data, which is not generated by you, so basically a chaos data structure. You wanna process it in real time, apply some sort of classification, do an aggregation, in real time, also save it for future use cases so that data science can be applied over it while still leveraging the machine learning models. And in a snap. Cool. What do we believe? We believe that there are going to be engineers who will keep using the petabytes of data that Fortune 100 companies today have. A lot of Fortune 100 companies today have petabytes of data which is just sitting in there. And nobody is really doing anything with it. Why? If you were to just take a stand back and think about it, because the data is really useful when you are trying to address a question. But by the time this data that is in petabytes sitting over there, there is no real question. So the consumer is not worried about it. The developer is not worried about it. Product is not worried about it. Nobody is worried about it. So in next few years, we believe there are going to be engineers who will keep on looking on conventional storage, which do not solve these problems in real time. While there are going to be few engineers, like your ones sitting in here, just kidding, but the ones which are actually going to adopt to the new industry standards and start moving towards real-time analytics and trying to answer those questions not only on the exploratory basis, but in really providing value to the consumers. How did we solve that? When we started designing and trying to think about that, what we want to keep in there, one thing was clear for us, that we wanted to have an architecture which is serving our users in real time. And at that point of time, and it's still the most important and sensible solutions for the real time is Spark Streaming. If I were to do a Spark streaming, no matter how many resources I'm going to put, there's going to be a certain amount of delay in there. So the only option we had was to divide it into multiple smaller parts. Computer technique, I believe that few of us are, should be here from computer science, divide and conquer. If you can't really do it in once, just divide it. But the beauty was not in dividing it. We divided one stream into smaller, smaller parts 
multiple Spark streams running, which not only gave us the faster processing, but also more scaling flexibility, better real-time user experience, and also rolling deployment. We could actually focus on each business use case separately, deploy them, and also scale them depending on their complexity. But the beauty was not in just in dividing. For divide and conquer, the conquer has to work. And till before 2.4, there were no stream joins. So it was not really possible for us. After stream joins being in there, the unification went in with the stream joins. And the whole real-time user experience started really making it to the production. Yes, as said in here, we use structured stream joins and multiple streams. Think about it, the amount of data that we are going to receive from different, different devices for each user. And if we were to start reprocessing for each use case, it is going to be really expensive from both the computation perspective and also time perspective. So we made a rule that golden words are not repeated, which means that each data, no matter how many use cases do we really want to process or fulfill, it is going to be executed only once. And for that, we used read once, write multiple times, and which was achieved through for each batch capability of structured streams. As we started moving forward, as you might have already known, but along the way as you start developing your platform, there is usually a need of some person in the organization, no offenses to anyone if somebody uses SQL in here, who wants SQL-like capabilities on a need no SQL platform. And we're gonna, in the end, also discuss that why this is important. It's not just being critical, but this is also important that there are SQL-like capabilities. But as we started moving forward, there were challenges in that. And with the introduction of Delta, we realized that finally, without losing the capacities and extra processing power time that Spark provides, you can really use Delta for ACID-like transactions. So if I were to give an analogy, it would be putting an F1 car on a freeway to reach its full speed legally without breaking it apart. Of course, only one aggregation is not enough. We needed multiple aggregations. Using Spark structured scream, we did in-memory, which you can think of real-time experience timestamp because you cannot just keep it infinite in memory because the user's data keep on coming and you really don't want to run out of memory, and windowed to be really able to use smaller, smaller buckets in different type of aggregations. And yes, many of them at the same time. And how did we achieve that? Because the Spark Structure Stream in itself just let you do one aggregation in the stream. Most, more than one is going to give you compilation errors. We used for each batch for even achieving that. And this is what our 10,000 feet view of our data. Of course, this is really 10,000 feet view of our architecture. It's not that simple as it looks. The box that you see on the right-hand side with the Spark and Databricks in there, it is much more complicated as it looks. But yes, we use different kind of data stores depending on what use cases are we trying to really fit into, using API gateways to get our data into Kinesis streams processes through machine learning, Spark, and Databricks, heavily using, storing it, and giving it back to our users, depending on who they are. Which brings us to a quick demo time. So hopefully my cluster hasn't died. Let's see. So what we're going to do in here is quickly start looking at, OK, this is still alive, I believe. Yes, it is. I'm going to clean up whatever we have done for the previous demo. Just going to set up initial path for the purposes of confidentiality. We cannot share really the notebooks that we develop at Asherion. So I have written on community edition certain notebooks, which can be used for this demo purpose. We are going to use some lending data, which is open source available. If you're going to look at here, I'm just creating a smaller set of data from bigger one for only purposes of showing the capabilities in here. We move forward, create the schema, make two streams out of the same data with different attributes so that we can see that how the streams themselves are evolving. And if you were aware, 
that for running streams, you need schemas for running start Spark structured streams. So we just calculated our schemas moving forward, compiling the streams, now joining the streams. Of course, one has to remember that you can not do any outer joins. Only outer joins in the streams are available for the even time. And we can discuss the reasons why it's so. Uh, otherwise, it is always an inner join. This is how the data is going to look like. I'm not really going to execute it because it's going to take a while. It's community addition, only eight nodes. And this is quite a big data. So uh, let's just leave it there. Here, I'm going to run some aggregations. Because without aggregations, what is life? Nothing. Your manager, nobody is going to like it. The product is never going to like it if you have not run any aggregations. So here we are seeing that how many, what was the loan amount, what was the home ownership, which is rent, owned, or mortgaged, and then how many of those were actually dispersed. And then here we are going to see another one, which is for borrower stream that we created just above. Uh, the borrowers, each state, how many borrowers were there. Let them compile, and then what we're going to do is we're going to add our new record into the stream from the data source that we have read to see if our aggregations update, because we have done a join in there. So just for purposes of that. It's compiling pretty fast. It's computing. In the meantime, when we will be adding that, what we're going to see is clean up some tables that we are going to use for delta tables later on moving forward. We're going to also, OK, it looks like this is compiled. So this is how our first aggregation looks like. And this is happening in memory. Yes, these aggregations should be timestamped. These aggregations should be windowed, which I have not put in here. But this is for just demo purposes. If you are really running something in production, you want to them to be windowed and timestamped. Otherwise, you will run, start running out of memory pretty soon, depending on the amount of data that you guys will receive. So I'm going to, I really want this one to come up because I'm going to see. So here, you see that the lowest number of California, that's highest, sorry. There is nothing for Illinois. So there is, I'm going to add new record for the Illinois, which is if written successfully and processed, should show up in our aggregations pretty quickly. So let's wait for it to update. Where it go? Just a few seconds. Not yet. This is the interesting part. You never know that we, when you're going to hit the sweet point of reaching in there. This is where you can see that the data we added in this stream it is processed, $20,001. The new home ownership, which I added, and then the count was one. We're going to come in here and see if it is processed in this stream. And it is processed. You say, Illinois, you had just one. Did we do anything? It was just a real-time data which got updated on its own because it is running as a stream. So we're going to move forward, trying to persist the data. Of course, it is of no use if we are not persisting it somewhere. It has to be in some store. Probably it can be returning it back to the where you started producing the data to the customer or just some data store. So. This is where I produce this data, and this is intentional error. If we start executing it, this is going to take a while. But this query actually runs, and then this is the kind of data that you can produce in here. So you write to Delta, and then you can read it through SQL. The specific idea was that you can run a SQL cluster, and then your data scientist can hook in there and utilize it without you being worried about it. Moving forward, now how about you ran, you already wrote, we already saved the aggregations in there. but how about the raw data? You wanted to write it. So what would be the easiest solution? Just take that stream and say that you want to write it again. This error is intentional because I don't want it to compile, which means that you are processing the same data twice. So the rules, every time you are making change to first stream, you have to make it to second stream as well. 
Was there any other way that you could have done it in just once? Yes. That is where the for each batch comes handy. We're going to skip this line, and we're going to just go a little bit below. So this is exactly the same stream that we created above. We're going to create it. And here, we're going to say write stream. But instead of saying a location, what I'm going to say is for each batch, which means that every time you get some data, execute this function. Let's see that what's the definition of this function looks like. And it does not find that function. So what I'm going to do is compile that function, run this, and come back here. So explaining here, what are we doing the steps? This is the function. The very first part is just the raw data. You're saying that whatever data we get in here, which is a DF. Now, at this point of time, you're not talking about streams. You're talking about the data frame. So which means you really do not have to worry about the specific update type, what is the mode, and other complexities which comes with the stream. Here, you're talking about the basic understanding of data frame. So you take the data frame. You just say write mode, save mode as a pan, and you say parquet. I want to save it in parquet. That's it. You saved in parquet, perfectly fine. But you can do only one action on the stream if you are not inside for each batch. What it gives you capability is doing the aggregations in here. More than one, we have just done one. You can do multiple aggregations and it should work perfectly as easily as it does for the one. And after that, you just write those aggregations again. So you have performed two actions, multiple aggregations using the for each batch, which makes the data processing really, really, really simple and unified. At one place, you can apply the same business rules and write in multiple times as you want to. So we're going to see if this was written perfectly fine. Should be able to read it from here. And I'll also execute the other one. So just executing the data once, yet being able to read it. This is processing the data inside one loop in different formats, fulfilling different use cases. Getting out of it, uh, now that's challenging. I was expecting that. Where's my pointer? There you go. And there you go. No? Perfect. So what were our learnings out of it? For us, there were multiple learnings, but there were two specifically that we wanted to cover. One was time to market, another one was skill and adoption. For time to market, certain times, the challenge is that can you build all these capabilities on your own with the ACID-like capabilities that the SQL is in there? Yes, it is possible that you can build all those, but that might cost you opportunity. So you always do not want to go out and build some Everything on your own, sometimes you need to buy. And that is where the delta comes in handy. For scale and adoption, we are in that point of industry where a lot of people are really good at SQL understanding. The data scientists understand SQL. The developers also understand SQL. But the Spark is revolutionizing and MapReduce and other kind of stores which are no SQL. And then if you start designing something which is for NoSQL, not many people are going to come and easily adopt it. There's going to be a curve. But if there was an interface in between which can fill this gap, that would, that would get the adoption and scale really higher. Scale because you have NoSQL there, and adoption because you have SQL in there. That's why we always, whenever talk, we always say that NoSQL also has a SQL. We have to remember that. And with our understanding and then the for each batch and other capabilities that have been built by Spark Streaming, we really think that Lambda architecture is poised to die. You really do not need to save and process data into different iterations. You can, like we have seen in for each batch, save the exact same data just once. With that, I would like to thank everybody for listening to us. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Uh, thank you for nice talk. So we have like roughly eight minutes. So if you guys have questions, then raise hands, please. So one question I have. I mean, you use a party to patch. Okay, so normally there's streaming. Uh, when you use a party, uh, I, I read the article when we implement that it 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 process row by row operations. So how, how do we, when you choose for each batch, it's like kind of row by operation, it's like a batch process, that's right. Sure, uh, so do we have to repeat? Hello, okay. Uh, the question is, is whether this is still row to row operation inside of for each batch. Uh, and the answer is for each batch gives you data frame API. So uh, whenever you can stop thinking about the streaming at this point, and you can think that for this one batch, the streaming stopped, and now you have that micro batch available, and you're doing with this micro batch whatever you would do with a normal batch processing, right? So when you write that, it is effectively, you know, applying your transformations and your aggregations on row by row, and it's writing. This, you would still write one parquet file. I mean, sorry, I'll take that back. You will write as many as partition there was. That many files you would write. Uh, but effectively, the processing inside of each batch is not different than the typical data frame or data set processing. So, so that means the for each batch, uh, I can implement the transformation uh, aggregation logic also in that. So basically, you can do everything that you can do on a data frame inside for each batch. Okay. You can just forget that you are working in a streaming. Once you are inside for each batch, it's just a data frame. It's just a smaller size of data frame. Thank you. But what you have to really keep in mind, which is important, is that you just don't overdo things in there because this is the only place where you're going to actually perform all your actions. Remember, everything till now, until you really hit inside your for each batch, was just transformations. So you can see probably when explaining and just executing, everything happens in milliseconds and for each batch for execution itself is taking five minutes for even five records. So we really want to hit not that corner scenario. You want to still optimize your things, but yet keep it not into multiple processings. Yeah, actually, can I ask a question? <laughs> sure. Actually, uh, it, it looks really interesting, like use case that use structure streaming intensively, right? And then I was wondering, like, if there is like something you'd like to in structure stream streaming, like itself, because like, I mean, I'm a Spark Amita and PMC itself, and then I'd, I'd like to know and learn from like this use case. So. Sure, I, I, we really think that at this point of time, if you're thinking about the streams of both of them, like you say two streams, very simple. And at this point of time, the only outer joints you can perform are on the time columns. But the data that you keep on receiving is not necessarily going to be always in sequence or always going to be time series. You not only want them out of time, but also want to keep that, what if I do not receive the data from the other place at all? So we were lucky that this time we just created two streams out of the same data which is matched. But in real scenario, it's one device generating another data and then you're getting a third party data as a stream. And you want to join them. So you should have the capability for doing left joins, outer joins, at least one kind of outer join on the streams, which would be really, really helpful. Yeah, thank you so much. That makes sense. Uh, I think we have a couple of minutes. So do you guys have like last question maybe? Actually, can I ask one more question? I have one more too. <laughs> I mean, I'm a like you know, as a data big software engineer. Like, did you guys like what was the like technical challenges in Delta, like when you guys use it, like firstly? Um, I think one of the first uh, technical challenges by using Delta was inability to write to one table from multiple streams. So uh, this was a uh, one of the typical scenarios that we would like to create is we have a two different, potentially two different streams processing two different, two different columns of the same data set. And being able to apply the transactional updates to that one table from more than one stream. So right now, the only way around it is to do a stream joins. And the problem, as Shobit mentioned, is with only one aggregation being allowed, join in itself is already an aggregation. Right, so you lose completely any aggregations on top of that because you already used your one aggregation for the join itself. Uh, so what we would really 
hope to see in the future and you know we're always open to help uh, and you know whether it's a contributing or testing or validating use case is of seeing an ability to stream uh, from more than one sync or more than one stream to one to, to one table setting on top of it for the streaming part um, we are in talks with Michael and the team at the Databricks, but we really believe that at this point of time, the update mode for for each batch, if written inside that, it doesn't really work. So we're not sure if this is the intended capaci capability, is it designed that way, or we just missed some part. So we're still waiting for a confirmation to open a bug and then probably make some progress in there. All right, thank you so much, Honest Opinion, thank and thank you, you for much. this fantastic talk. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, everyone. You.